Hello listeners and welcome to another episode of Cobb's Corner. I am your host, Morgan Cobbs. In today's episode, we're going to be reviewing Captain America Civil War. This film saw the Avengers be torn in two over the Sokovia Accords, a UN resolution to put the Avengers under direct supervision of the United Nations following an Avengers mission that went south. This film saw the return of the late William Hurt as Thaddeus Thunderbolt Ross, the introduction of Tom Holland as Peter Parker, Spider-Man, and the introduction of the late Chadwick Boseman as T'Challa, the Black Panther. Like our last film, this film opens with a flashback scene to the year 1991. We see Bucky, who we now know is the Winter Soldier and was still the Winter Soldier at that time, be sent on a mission to track down and retrieve what appears to be a version of the Super Soldier Serum. We then cut to the present day, or the year 2016, which is when this movie takes place, and also the year that this movie came out, in Lagos, Nigeria, as Captain America, Black Widow, Falcon, and Wanda Maximoff are on a mission to track down Brock Rumlow, aka Crossbones, who we last saw at the end of uh, Captain America the Winter Soldier, and uh, for, from releasing a biological weapon. He invades um, IFID, the Institute for Infectious Diseases, and wants to release a biological weapon on in innocent civilians. They catch Rumlow, and just as he is about to be turned in, he mentions Bucky, and Cap freezes at the mention of his best friend, and he's unable to disarm Rumblow's bomb that he has strapped to himself. The bomb goes off, but Wanda's able to stop the explosion from happening, and she instead throws Rumlow into a building, which ends up killing innocent civilians. We then cut to Tony Stark giving a presentation at his alma mater, MIT, using binary augmented retroframing, or BARF, to recreate the, the last time that he saw his parents before they died. Barf like hijacks the, the hippocampus to give the user, I guess to the, the user will like revisit memories and we're gonna see this come up again in a future film. In the, in the first Iron Man movie at the press conference where you see Tony, he's like sitting down eating his cheeseburger and he like tells Stain, like, I never got to say goodbye to my dad. And, and, and so, so now, you know, chronologically speaking, about eight years later, he's now processing that grief that he never got to say goodbye to his own father. And uh, he announces that every MIT student is now an equal recipient of the September Foundation grant which will approve and front, approve and fully fund all of their projects. Um, after the presentation, he is met by a grieving mother who lost her son Spencer in Sokovia. She says how, like, oh, you know, there's a they say there's a correlation between generosity and guilt. Uh, the re the only thing you really fight for is yourself. My son is dead, and I blame you. So, and then there's this look of like fear and of guilt in Tony's eyes, so throughout the rest of this film, Tony's gonna be pretty much acting out of guilt, you know, for the Battle of Sokovia and then you know, all these different disasters, you know, he before he was acting out of fear, fear of an incoming alien army after the Battle of New York, but now he's acting out of guilt. So back at the Avengers facility, the team is met by Thaddeus Ross, who is now the Secretary of State. Last we saw him was in the Incredible Hulk. He was still in the army, so within the last eight years, he has left the army and is now serving as Secretary of State. He tells the team how they have routinely ignored sovereign borders. A team of U.S.-based enhanced individuals who have routinely ignored sovereign borders and inflicted their will around the world with no, co with no consequence, and they are un unconcerned with what they leave behind. He shows them footage of the Battle of New York, uh, the Triskelion disaster in Washington, D.C., the Battle of Sokovia, and the recent casualties in Lagos. And I think if you, if you look closely, 
there's about 300 innocent civilian casualties have come along with all of these all of these um these these, these attacks in total about 300 innocent civilians have just gotten caught in the crossfires it shows a team the sokovia accords a un resolution that's already been approved by over 100 countries and to put that into perspective there's i think 192 or 193 nations in the united nations of in, in in total so for it to be approved by over 100 that's you know over one majority of, of the countries have approved it they, and the the accords would put the avengers under direct supervision of the un this is similar to for those of you who have read the comics, the Superhero Registration Act in the Civil War crossover event in Marvel Comics that actually involved the X-Men and this actually came to me, I was I was watching like the original X-Men from the year 2000 that Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige was a producer on and in that movie they talk about mutants having to register having to, to register as mutants essentially so the superhero registration act and the sokovia accords you know there's that there's that similarity and at the time of the release of this movie marvel studios did not have the rights to mutants like you notice how in in um avengers age of ultron when the team is introduced to wanda and pietro cap says we have an enhanced in the field they couldn't legally say the word mutant so it was a different time maybe we'll see mutants in the future of, of, of the mcu fingers crossed uh you know i don't want to get get ahead of myself um but 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 yeah you know the superhero registration act is referenced so in the, in the actual civil war comics that's what it's called for the purpose of the mcu they're referring to it as the sokovia accords so the avengers war machine iron man black widow and vision all want to sign the accords while Captain America, Wanda Maximoff, and Falcon are against it initially. Vision says how it's the Avengers' very strength and independence as a team that invokes challenge and that, that in, invites challenge and chaos, which then breeds catastrophe. You know, he has this like mathematical equation, it's like you know, maybe the Accords are the best option because our independence and our autonomy as an entity is what invites challenge. Like in the eight years since Tony Stark revealed that he's Iron Man, the amount of potentially world-ending events has increased. And he does have a point there. You know, we're, 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 see, we're seeing the different ideologies. You know, we're seeing kind of like, you know, rationalism from Team Iron Man and then... You know, we're also seeing kind of from Captain America, he's resistant because he's gone through, uh, you know, the, the, the whole Winter Soldier movie and, and all that. So Steve says how the UN is run by people with agendas and those agendas change over time, to which Tony responds by saying that that's a good thing. And he points out how he stopped making weapons once he realized the damage that they were doing to the world. So he had his, you know, warmonger agenda, but then he saw the reality of what that of what that agenda had caused, and he nipped it in the bud, you know, put an end to it in the first Iron Man movie. But then Steve points out how Tony chose to do that, and if he signs these accords, then he's surrendering his right to choose. So Tony, you now again, out of guilt, you know, he shows the team a picture of. This boy Spencer had a 3.6 GPA, a major in computer science, and instead of going on vacation, you know, and, you know, af after after graduating college, you know, instead of going on vacation, he didn't go to Florida, he didn't go to Amsterdam. Instead, over the summer, he decided to put some miles on his soul before he parked it behind a desk, and he decided to build sustainable housing for the poor in Sokovia, and he never left that country alive. Tony says how they need to be put in check. Yeah. And if they can't accept limitations, then 
they're no better than the bad guys. Meanwhile, in Cleveland, former Hydra agent, the Hydra colonel who we saw in the flashback sequence, is found and murdered by Baron Helmut Zemo, played by Daniel, Daniel Bruhl, a survivor of the Battle of Sokovia. Zemo lost his entire family in the Battle of Sokovia, and using the encrypted Hydra files that Black Widow leaked, just, just put out there on the internet, at the end of Captain America the Winter Soldier, he was able to find the Hydra agent that we saw in the opening scene and steal his book with command words to activate the Winter Soldier, which are in, in, in Russian. So Black Widow sort of inadvertently at the end of Captain America the Winter Soldier created the villain for Baron Zemo. Like if you remember, um, Secretary Pierce asks Natasha, like, are you ready for the world to see you as you really are? She's like, just disabling all the protocols. Like, are you ready for the world to really see you as you really are? To which she responds, are you? So. We then cut back to the Avengers compound where Steve finds out that Peggy Carter has died. Like, in the middle of this, you know, debate, this division between the team, uh, Steve finds out the sad news that Peggy Carter has died in her sleep. He is a pallbearer at her funeral, where the funeral is in, in, in London. He's a pallbearer at her funeral, where uh, Peggy Carter's great niece, Sharon Carter, speaks about how her Aunt Peggy always said to compromise where you can, but where you cannot, it is your duty to plant yourself like a tree and say no. You move. This is the line that solidifies Cap's stance against the Accords. The next day, the Sokovia Accords are to be signed at the UN building in Vienna, Austria. We see Wakanda's King T'Chaka, played by John Kani, as well as Prince T'Challa, played by Chadwick Boseman. T'Chaka makes a speech about how a year ago, stolen Wakandan vibranium was used to create a deadly robotic army that wiped out Sokovia referring, of course, to Ultron. He then goes on to say how the innocent people that were killed in Lagos were Wakandans on a goodwill outreach mission. His speech is then interrupted as the building is bombed by who appears to be Bucky Barnes, the Winter Soldier. We see King T'Chaka killed, and his surviving son T'Challa weeps as he holds his late father in his arms. T'Challa vows revenge on the man who killed his father, who, at this point, we still think is Bucky who is hiding out in Bucharest, Romania. He is found by Captain America, who helps him escape from the Romanian police as they are then stopped by T'Challa, who we see for the first time in his Black Panther suit. Falcon joins the fight, and the four of them are apprehended by War Machine, along with the Romanian police. While en route to their detention facility, T'Challa mentions how the Black Panther has been the protector of Wakanda for generations, a mantle passed from warrior to warrior, and how with the recent, pa recent passing of his father, King T'Chaka, the mantles of both warrior and king now fall to him. They are taken to a CIA detention site where Cap's shield, along with Falcon's flight suit, are seized, and they are given an office where they must remain. You know, it's, it's not, not, not a jail cell. They're kind of just being interned at this black site. You know, they have an office. They're not allowed to leave. Tony shows Cap the two pens that FDR signed the Lend-Lease Act with, which was an actual act signed in 1941, if I'm not mistaken, which allowed the U.S. to supply allied nations with arms and ammunition during World War II. This was before Pearl Harbor. This was before we had officially, we had officially, officially entered the war, but it was like our way of supplying money and guns to support the war effort, to support our allied war effort in both Europe and also Asia. After mentioning how Tony has wanted to confine to the Avengers compound, Cap refuses to sign the accords and he says, you know, I hate to break up the hate to break up the set. You know, gives Tony the pen back, you know, hate to break up the set. And he refuses to sign the accords because, you know, he says, you know, every single time I think that you see things clearly, 
You just don't. So meanwhile, Bucky is detained and interviewed by a psychiatrist named Dr. Broussard. The psychiatrist is revealed to be Baron Zemo, who was posing as Broussard. The red book that he found, he and he's using the red book that he found to activate the Winter Soldier. He says the words and you know that that programming is still inside Bucky, although Bucky was not the one who had killed King T'Chaka. That was not him. But the you know words are still still in there. So Bucky breaks out of his holding cell and he is stopped by Iron Man along with Black Widow, Black Panther, Sharon Carter, and Sam Wilson. Bucky steals a helicopter and attempts to leave, but he is stopped by Captain America. After crashing the helicopter, Bucky is pulled from the river by Steve. S Steve returning the favor to Bucky that Bucky had given to Steve at the end of Captain America the Winter Soldier. Bucky pulled him from the river and now Steve's doing the exact same thing. Now, Cap, Falcon, and Bucky, they regroup in hiding, and Bucky says how he knows that Cap's name is Steve, his mom's name was Sarah, and he used to put newspapers in his shoes. Now, that last part is something that you can't read in a museum. So, Bucky goes on to say how he knew that the Hydra programming was still inside of him, and all Zemo had to do was say the activation words. He goes on to explain how the reason Zemo wanted to activate him is because he is not the only Winter Soldier. In another flashback sequence, we see how Hydra had an elite team of the most deadly people on Earth who can speak 15 languages and take down governments in a single night. A single night. In the flashback sequence, Bucky actually saves the Hydra colonel that was hiding out in Cleveland from a brawl that breaks out between a few of the other Winter Soldiers. Sam says how this all would have been easier a week ago and that they should tell Stark. Steve responds that he doesn't think Tony will believe him and... And even if he did, the Sokovia Accord, the Accords probably wouldn't even wouldn't even let Tony help them. And they're on their own on this one. Sam then says how maybe they're not alone. He knows a guy. Referring, of course, to Ant-Man. Back at the CIA detention facility, Secretary Ross tells Tony that he has 36 hours to turn in Rogers and Barnes. Natasha agrees to help T'Challa find Barnes, and Tony goes to Queens. More on that later. Back at the Avengers compound, Wanda is met by Clint Barton, aka Hawkeye, who we last saw go into retirement after Avengers Age of Ultron. He tells Wanda that Cap needs their help and they've got to go. They are stopped by Vision, who Hawkeye realizes that he can't overpower. Instead, it is Wanda who forces Vision down several floors into the earth and Wanda and Hawkeye escape and they go find Cap. While in Queens, Tony finds a young man named Peter Parker, played by Tom Holland, who is the MCU's version of Spider-Man. Tony uses the September Foundation grant mentioned earlier in the film as a cover story for Peter's Aunt May, and he then talks privately with Peter about his goal as Spider-Man and his motiv what his motivation is. Peter's motivation for being Spider-Man and fighting crime is to, quote, look out for the little guy. After some banter between Tony and Peter, Peter says, when you can do the things that I can, and then the bad things happen, they happen because of you. This is similar to the iconic, with great power, there must also come great responsibility that was said by Stan Lee himself at the end of Amazing Fantasy number 15, aka Spider-Man's comic book debut 60 years ago in 1962. In this scene, Tom Holland forgot about the setting of the scene, so without breaking character, Robert Downey Jr. says the line, I'm going to sit down so you move the leg. Downey then quickly glances off screen. Tony then tells Pepper that he, tell, tell, ah, tells Peter, my, my bad, that he has to come with him to Berlin to help him stop Captain America. We then cut to Cap, Sam, and Bucky in a getaway car underneath a bridge where they meet up with Sharon Carter, who has all of their confiscated gear, including Cap's shield and Falcon's flight suit. Flight suit. Cap and Sharon share a kiss, and then Sharon goes on the run as she has just stolen government property. We may see her again soon. Team Cap meets at an airport in Leipzig, Germany. The team consists of Cap, Bucky, Falcon, Hawkeye, Wanda, and Ant-Man, who was picked up by Falcon, for those of you who remember the ending of the movie Ant-Man. 
the six of them see a helicopter and attempt to escape only to have the helicopter disabled and for them to be greeted by Team Iron Man, which consists of Iron Man, War Machine, Vision, Black Panther, Black Widow, and Spider-Man. Iron Man tells Cap that he needs to turn over Barnes and come with them. He then yells, under ruse, and Spider-Man reveals himself and steals Cap's shield. Through a sneak attack by Ant-Man, Cap gets his shield back and the battle is on. Team Cap fights against Team Iron Man as Falcon locates the Quinjet in an airport hangar and just as everyone from Team Cap is running towards the Quinjet, Vision shows up and blasts his Mind Stone to stop the team and tells Captain America to surrender for the greater good. Team Cap charges forward as does Team Iron Man and we get my second favorite shot in the film. A wide shot that mirrors the intro of the 90s X-Men cartoon where everyone is running towards each other. The battle rages on and Spider-Man faces off against Falcon and the Winter Soldier while Hawkeye fights Black Panther and at one point Vision even slices a bus in half. <laughs> It's a really great scene. I highly recommend that you all watch it yourselves. It's by far one of my favorite battles in the MCU. Throughout the battle, Ant-Man has a run-in with every member of Team Iron Man and loses. He gets zapped by Black Widow. He recreates the cover of Avengers issue 223 by laying down on Hawkeye's arrow and sneaks into Iron Man's armor and attempts to disable it, although he is still blown out by the fire firing suppression system. It's like... You know, he goes into Iron Man's suit, and then he starts, like, telling him, like, oh, you're going to have to get this check. And then and then Iron Man's like, who's speaking? And then Ant-Man responds, like, it's your conscience. We don't talk very much these days. And then he's like, and then it's like Friday. It's like deploying fire, firing suppression system. And then Ant-Man still gets blown out of the suit. We even get a teaser for the next Ant-Man movie as he grows and becomes huge and grabs War Machine and then War Machine responds with, okay, tiny dude is big now. Spider-Man references the movie Empire Strikes Back by suggesting that he should wrap his webs around Ant-Man's legs and then and, and then the rest while the rest of them try to knock him down. In the Marvel comics, Ant-Man was called Giant Man. Giant Man whenever he became big, although he is still called Ant-Man in the MCU regardless of his size. Ant-Man collapses and shrinks back down to his regular size. Meanwhile, Cap and Bucky run for the Quinjet but are stopped by Vision as he cuts down an air traffic control tower which is then stopped from falling by Wanda who is then blasted with War Machine's sonic cannon. This is the same sonic cannon technology that we saw in the Stark Industries Sonic Cannon truck in The Incredible Hulk. Cap and Bucky are met by Black Widow at the Quinjet as she tells them to move and she continuously blasts Black Panther and stops him from catching them, officially betraying Iron Man and joining Team Captain America. Cap and Bucky fly off in the Quinjet and Black Widow s says that she would help T'Challa find Bucky, not catch him. There is a difference. As Cap and Bucky are flying off, they are pursued by Iron Man and War Machine, who is being followed by Falcon. Vision accidentally blasts War Machine, causing him to be paralyzed. Cap and Bucky escape, and the rest of the team is imprisoned at the Raft, which is a former underwater shield prison in the Pacific Ocean. Stark shows up to the prison and is greeted by an angry Secretary Ross. Stark goes into the holding area where all of Team Cap, Sans, Cap, and Bucky is being held in their prison cells. He goes over to Falcon's cell and after disabling the audio of the raft's audio and visual feed, asks him where Cap and Bucky went and Falcon tells Stark where they are unbeknownst to Secretary Ross. Tony leaves the raft in his helicopter and doesn't tell Ross anything about Rogers. En route to Rogers, Stark's AI Friday who we met in Avengers Age of Ultron, shows him a priority upload from Berlin police showing Dr. Broussard, the doctor who's supposed to meet with Bucky in Romania, dead in a hotel room bathroom and bathtub in Berlin. The doctor is played by Joe Russo, one of the directors of this movie. I'm pretty sure Joe Russo makes a cameo in every MCU film that's directed by the Russo brothers. So, so far, Captain America the Winter Soldier, he was the doctor that we saw when they found 
uh, Steve when they found um, Nick Nick Fury in like that I guess safe house area and in this movie he plays Dr. Broussard although he doesn't have any lines uh, the police also discovered that it was Zemo that killed Dr. Broussard and in that same hotel room found a wig and facial prosthetics approximating the appearance of James Buchanan Barnes, a.k.a. the Winter Soldier. Upon realizing this, Stark quickly changes into his Mark 46 armor and leaves his remotely piloted helicopter and goes and finds Steve, unbeknownst to him that he is being followed by T'Challa. Steve and Bucky reach the old Siberian Hydra base that we saw in the opening flashback sequence. They are met by Iron Man as he admits that Bucky was in fact framed for the murder of King T'Chaka and Zemo is the real villain. The three of them go into the main room where they realize that Zemo has killed the remaining Winter Soldiers who were, I guess, in cryogenesis or, or on ice. Zemo shows them footage from December 16th, 1991, which was the mission that we saw in the opening flashback. In the full footage, it is revealed that Bucky, as the Winter Soldier, is the one who killed Tony's parents, Howard and Maria Stark. Tony is both shocked, angry, and sad all at once. After this realization, and he asks Steve if he knew, to which Steve admits that he knew it was Hydra and that he didn't, but he did not know that it was Bucky. Now we see in Captain America the Winter Soldier, you saw um, in that area where they had um, uh, Zola, you know, Zola with all that, you know, really old computers, really old technology, like he kind of goes through like footage, like you see like a newspaper about a newspaper that says how Howard and Maria Stark were killed by Hydra. So Tony attacks Bucky and he's stopped by Cap as Cap says that Hydra had his mind and that it wasn't really Bucky who killed his parents. Unable to listen to reason, Tony continues to attack Bucky, and Cap is forced to defend his best friend. The fight rages on, and it's Captain America and the Winter Soldier versus Iron Man. We even get my favorite shot in the film where Iron Man blasts at Captain America's shield, recreating the cover of Civil War issue 7. Bucky goes for Iron Man's chest piece, and Iron Man then blasts off Bucky's metal arm. Cap pins down Iron Man and punches off his headpiece and slams his shield into his chest piece, disabling his armor. He could have killed Iron Man, but instead he, in the heat of the moment, makes that conscious decision to just disable his armor. Cap walks away with Bucky, and Tony tells him that he doesn't deserve that shield, so Cap just leaves it behind. This is the beginning of no, Nomad Steve Rogers, where he no longer wears the mantle of Captain America. As Iron Man, Captain America, and the Winter Soldier were fighting, Zemo was just sitting outside. He is approached by T'Challa, who admits that he almost killed the wrong man. After Zemo explains how his family died during the Battle of Sokovia, T'Challa explains to Zemo how vengeance has consumed you. It's consuming them. I am done letting it consume me. T'Challa stops Zemo from taking his own life. The living are not done with you yet, T'Challa says. As T'Challa turns Zemo over to the, over to the authorities, 